the monotonous autumn rain had been falling for several days, casting a pall of gloom over all the city's inhabitants. On the highway, it often caused traffic jams and even accidents. In such weather, it was hard to see the road, let alone control the vehicle. But despite this, in the driver's seat of one of the expensive SUVs sat a handsome, stately man who was holding the wheel with only one hand. With his other hand, he was flipping through papers from a small black folder, completely absorbed in its contents, paying very little attention to the road. Recently, Richard had begun to suspect his wife of infidelity. At 40 years old, he was on his third marriage and believed he understood women quite well. Therefore, he paid little heed to friends who constantly told him he was too trusting. For the past three years, his companion had been Regina, a young, vibrant and stunning woman. Such women are typically pampered, their beauty treatments paid for without question, and they are paraded in the finest evening attire to make everyone around envious. Richard was delighted to have found such a gem. He mentally roared with satisfaction when he saw envy and admiration in the eyes of others, as these were the emotions his wife, his precious gift, was supposed to evoke. But it is precisely such women who cheat at the first opportunity. Almost all his friends warned Richard that Regina was a typical gold digger who would quickly trade him for a bigger bag of money, but he brushed them off. However, in the last two months he had begun to notice some oddities in her behaviour. Sometimes she wouldn't answer phone calls in the middle of the day, or she wouldn't spend a cent for an entire day although she usually had no habit of denying herself anything, or she would be late for meetings. The final straw was when she hesitated before calling him by name. Richard didn't bat an eye at the time, pretending not to notice, but he hired a private detective that very day. Now he was driving back from the detective with disheartening news. The detective had handed over a folder full of detailed evidence showing where, when, and with whom his wife spent her free time, and had verbally expressed his condolences. Richard's wife was indeed cheating on him. The folder mainly contained photos and papers with recorded conversations. In some of the photos, Regina was standing in the arms of another man. Richard frowned and tried to pull out a photo to examine it more closely and see if he might know the guy, but he had forgotten just how bad an idea it was to get distracted while driving in the rain. The car hit a puddle, and it started to skid. Richard cursed, grabbing the wheel with both hands, but it was too late. The car's hood crashed into a tree. As he began to lose consciousness from the impact, Richard thought about how stupid this kind of death would be. Stella always believed that personal matters shouldn't mix with work. She was a surgeon, saving lives regardless of whether the patients were known to her or not. But today, her professional ethics were severely tested. An accident had occurred somewhere, and the victim was brought to her department for emergency surgery. The victim was all too familiar to her. In a previous accident, caused by this man, Stella's husband had died, and this guy had gotten off scot-free by bribing someone. The court had ruled that her husband, Frankie, was at fault. Now, looking at the operating table, Stella was having serious doubts for the first time. Providence had intervened, punishing the bastard as he deserved, and now she would bring him back to life with her own hands. Of course she had taken the Hippocratic Oath, but she didn't even need to intervene. In just an hour, without surgery, he would die on his own. This would be the ultimate justice death for death. Looking at the man's face, twisted in pain, she remembered his name. Richard, his name was Richard, and this was the expression she had always wanted to see on his face. This was the expression she had desperately wanted to see when she lost the court case. She almost made up her mind, but her conscience started to gnaw at her. Now she had to do her job and nothing more. She would save his life, as she should, because she was a top-notch surgeon and wouldn't let anyone doubt it. The operation lasted more than five hours. 
the man had to be practically pieced back together. He had suffered very serious internal injuries from the impact. When the work was done and the patient was taken to the ward, Stella, for some reason, decided to rest near him. She needed a little more time to think about whether she had done the right thing. Richard struggled to open his eyes. His head was splitting as if it was about to explode and his ears were ringing. Focusing on anything was difficult, but from fragments of the surroundings he realized he was in a hospital room. After a while, his brain finally registered the presence of a girl in a white coat nearby. She was dozing wearily in a chair, her head resting against the back. It was like a cold wave washed over him. He recognized her. She was the girl who had almost five years ago tried to accuse him of her husband's death, and even, he remembered, genuinely believed him to be guilty. She must have felt his gaze because she reluctantly opened her eyes too. Their eyes met, and it was immediately clear from her expression that she recognized him as well. Can I have some water? Richard croaked. The girl's face became stone-like, and she silently poured water into a glass, brought it to him, and even helped him take a life-saving sip. How are you feeling? She asked in a professionally polite tone looking at the patient with marked coldness. Like I've been through a meat grinder, to be honest. That's normal for someone whose organs were almost turned to mush. She quickly checked the bandages and, satisfied with the results, nodded coldly again. A nurse will come soon to change your bandages and IV. Your relatives will be contacted, but they won't be able to visit you until the evening. Until then. You are prescribed bed rest and a diet. All the best. She turned hurriedly to leave the room, but Richard remembered her name. Stella. Nah. The girl flinched as if struck and turned around. Her eyes seemed to scream, What more do you want from me? But Richard met her gaze calmly. Thank you, he said sincerely, not averting his eyes. I can't imagine what this cost you. Thank you very much. The girl's face twitched. She lowered her eyes, reluctantly nodded to accept the gratitude, and left. Richard was left alone. His eyes closed from exhaustion, and he missed the nurse's next visit. However, by evening he had to wake up because the room had become noisy. This time, the first thing he saw upon waking was the well-groomed face of Regina, Oh, darling, you're awake, she chirped happily. Well, everyone kept saying you were always sleeping. Is that any reason not to visit you? The staff at this clinic is terrible. We need to transfer you to another one, or even better, bring you home and hire caregivers. We won't go broke, right? I'm glad to see you too, dear, he said with a crooked smile, not even trying to look friendly. The abrupt awakening made his head hurt even more than before. I'm very glad you're interested in my well-being, but I'm not going anywhere for now. Moreover, I plan to return to my home when you're no longer there. The girl blinked stupidly. I don't understand. Where will I be? Wherever you want. You can go to that hotel you've been frequenting lately. Did you notice? The girl smiled slightly, her smile strained. It was a surprise. You know I've always wanted to become an actress. So recently I was invited to auditions. On these auditions you can stay, the man interrupted her sharply. You're really not cut out to be an actress. But maybe they'll take pity, won't kick you out. And in the meantime, you'll see how that guy you cheated on me with will treat you when he realizes you're free now. He struggled to gather his thoughts. This monologue was difficult for him, and his head mercilessly pounded. The girl kept opening and closing her mouth, like a fish washed ashore, and her skin broke out in patches. In any case, you can keep the car, and you can take your stuff. I don't need them at home at all. My lawyer will arrange the divorce very soon. The car? 
I'm entitled to half of the property. Richard smiled crookedly. This time, completely sincerely, he informed her about the divorce, and her first concern was about her share. You'll manage. I have evidence of your infidelity, so I have the right to leave you with nothing. Take what you're given and get lost. The girl became even more enraged. Oh, really? You know, I have a lawyer, too. See you in court, you idiot. Richard became so angry that he grabbed the food container she brought and hurled it against the wall with all his might. The container shattered with a crash, and the liquid splattered in an unsightly stain. And Regina was so infuriated by this that without thinking, she grabbed a vase of flowers and hurled it at her sick husband. What's going on here? The nurse who rushed in immediately grabbed the girl, who was ready to pounce on the patient. But Richard, miraculously dodging the massive glass jar, was ready for revenge. The vase shattered right next to him. The flying shards embedded in his arm, and only the agonizing pain in his stomach made him slump back onto the pillow, losing consciousness with a groan. Stop it. Stella who rushed in at the noise, shouted. First, she assessed the chaos unfolding, then the patient's condition, and nearly cursed. The bandages over his eyes were soaked in blood because the fresh stitches had come apart. The patient to the third operating room, she shouted to the medical personnel running after her. This lady to security, and call the executive director. Let them sort it out on camera who's right. You have no right, the girl squealed, but the nurse, with little respect, simply dragged her towards security. They would sort it out there. And Stella, in a matter of seconds, helped the nurses load Richard onto a gurney and ran with him to the operating room. Someone had already informed the assistants, and by the time the patient arrived, they had almost finished all the preparations. Stella, putting on gloves on the go, immersed herself in work. The task ahead was no less meticulous than last time. Somehow the man had again disturbed all his insides. Already after the procedure, he began to regain consciousness and weakly tossed in delirium from anesthesia. So that's how it is, Stella addressed him. By long-standing habit, she always said something to the patients after the operation, knowing that they could hear her. Didn't like lying here again, huh? If you start twitching again, disturbing the stitches, I'll tie you to the bed, she said, feeling a sense of duty fulfilled, and left the operating room to get ready to go home. At home, as usual, she was almost knocked over by a small, happy hurricane. Mummy! Quiet, quiet, Stella laughed, hugging her son. At five years old, Tony was already a tall boy, reaching her waist. Lifting him as she used to was becoming quite difficult. Hello, Stella, Mrs. Bennett asked as she emerged from the room. Rough day today. The elderly neighbor had been helping Stella for five years, looking after her son in the evenings. Yes, it was tough, Mrs. Bennett, the young woman admitted honestly. I don't know what I would do without your help. Don't worry, dear. I should be thanking you for giving me something to do in my old age. Otherwise, I would have died of boredom long ago, she said softly as she headed towards her apartment. So, Tony, tell me what you did in preschool today. Stella turned to her son with a smile. Oh, guess what we did today? You'll never guess. Stella listened to her son with a smile. As he changed into his home clothes and washed up, he ran after her around the apartment, eagerly recounting his exciting day. Only after making sure his mum was up to date on all his adventures did he go off to play. Stella, smiling at her son, went to prepare dinner. Cooking was always meditative for her, and once again she pondered why she deserved such a fate. She wondered if things would be so hard now if Frankie were alive. Probably not, it's always easier with two than one. Yes, his parents are still alive and provide financial help, 
but they live far abroad. She had only seen them twice in her life at her wedding and at her husband's funeral. Her own parents had died when she was twenty-two, not even waiting for the birth of their grandson. Mum, are you crying? Tony asked, peering worriedly into her face. Stella hadn't noticed when he managed to leave his toys and come to her. No, what are you talking about? She tried to smile as sincerely as possible. I was just cutting onions and they got in my eyes. Tony nodded trustingly, hugged her, and ran back to his room. Stella returned to chopping the onions, trying to brush away the veil of tears from her eyes. The time when Tony was just born was the happiest for their family. She was truly loved, and loved both her boys more than life. But then the ill-fated accident happened, and life seemed to lose all its colours. Perhaps Stella didn't give up for two reasons Tony, who needed his mum, and her desire for revenge on Richard. According to the official report, Frankie was driving drunk, and in the dark he crashed into a bus stop. Fortunately, no one was there, so there were no additional casualties, but the driver himself did not survive the crash and died on the spot but Stella knew that Frankie never drove drunk. From the footage of a nearby store's cameras, she found out that at the exact moment her husband crashed into the stop, only one car was passing by on the empty road. They were driving calmly one after the other. But as soon as that second car tried to overtake, Frankie's car started to skid. It clearly couldn't have been a simple coincidence, and Stella tried to track down the owner of that ill-fated SUV. It turned out to be Richard, whom she subsequently took to court, accusing him of the accident. But no one wanted to listen to her. Richard was a wealthy man, and it was no surprise that he remained unpunished. Another video surfaced from different cameras, supposedly showing much more clearly that nothing untoward had happened and that overtaking on that part of the road was not prohibited by the rules. All Stella could do was feel the anger, understanding that the person responsible for all her misery was free. And today, today he appeared on her operating table, having been in another severe accident. How just would it be to let him die? Why did she decide to play the heroine, saving his life? No one would have blamed her. Medical errors happen. She could have easily staged it as an accident, but no, she decided to play the role of an offended innocent. She was afraid to dirty her hands with blood. However, a little later, watching her son eat with great appetite, Stella thought her decision had been the right one. Even if Richard didn't appreciate her nobility, there was always another reason a happy Tony, whose mother wouldn't see herself as a murderer. Richard was recovering quickly. He had spent almost a month bedridden in the hospital during which time his lawyer had prepared all the divorce papers. Regina faced issues because of her outburst at the hospital. This incident was also added to the case as an act of violence against a patient, and now she had no prospects at all. Over the past month, Stella had become a frequent visitor to his hospital room. She tried to come only when he was asleep, but gradually Richard figured out her visits and started watching her. Each time she simply stared at his face thoughtfully, sometimes adjusting his bandages, and then left. There was no aggression from her, although Richard knew she would have preferred not to save him. He vividly remembered the scorching look she gave him in court. Richard thought this story was long behind him, but now it resurfaced. In reality, there were quite a few people in the world who hated him, but for some reason he felt particularly ashamed in front of this woman. A childish desire arose to prove to her that he hadn't been guilty back then. So after being discharged, the first thing he did was call the detective, Mr. The detective had shown himself to be a true professional in the case with Regina, so Richard decided to trust him in this matter as well. Richard spent another three weeks on legal proceedings. Despite the case being crystal clear and straightforward, 
and the divorce legally finalized, Regina kept trying to carve out a bigger piece of property for herself, and out of principle, Richard took everything from her, even the car he initially intended to leave her. Then came the crucial day. Mr. Rivera called and informed him that everything was ready. The meeting, as before, was scheduled at his small headquarters. Richard arrived there as prepared as possible. Memories of the accident, though they had faded, hadn't completely vanished, and he wanted to avoid repeating the experience. Mr. Rivera told Richard what he had found. An hour later, Richard was sitting in his car in front of the hospital, waiting for Stella. He knew her shift ended around five, and she didn't have her own transportation, so the plan was to give her a ride home and, at the same time, talk to her. Mainly to talk, of course. The first snow had fallen, and the wait dragged on, so Richard almost missed Stella's appearance. When he saw her, he barely managed to rush out to meet her. Good evening, Stella. May I give you a ride home? Stella stared at him distrustfully, hesitating to accept the offer. There was a slight fear in her eyes. I don't bite, Richard tilted his head to the side. Honestly, I would have invited you to a restaurant to talk, but I know you don't have extra time, so I just want to give you a ride home. Consider it a kind of gratitude for saving me. Stella reluctantly nodded. She got into the car very slowly, not feeling safe. Richard didn't rush her, helped close the door like a gentleman, got into the driver's seat, confirmed the address, and entered it into the GPS. It was going to be a long drive. Stella, I want to talk to you, he began cautiously, slowly pulling out of the parking lot. I clearly remember the circumstances of our first meeting. You accused me of the accident that killed your husband. Correct? Stella reluctantly nodded. She didn't like that he brought up this topic, but there was nowhere to escape from the car in the middle of the road. You still consider me guilty, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Correct. Stella nodded even more reluctantly. In that case, may I ask why you decided to save my life? You had a good opportunity to take revenge. No one would have suspected anything. The woman flinched. I'm... I'm not a murderer, she replied quietly but firmly. I won't deny I had the urge, but I overcame it. Really, Richard chewed his lips. His gaze was fixed solely on the road. In that case, let me thank you again. As for the past accident, you conducted an investigation, didn't you? Yes, I did, Stella replied pursing her lips discontentedly. And the result of your investigation was a battered video recording not from the nearest camera, based on which you accused me. Interesting. The examination found alcohol in my husband's blood, and based on that, he was deemed responsible for the accident, Stella squinted coldly. But you see, my husband never allowed himself to drink alcohol before driving. And that's why you suspected something was wrong, Richard nodded to his own thoughts. May I ask, did you know your husband well? Naturally, the woman nodded even more coldly. This conversation was beginning to openly anger her. Ah, uh ha. -huh. Richard paused for a moment, gathering his thoughts. The upcoming conversation was not going to be easy. Actually, as someone who knew from the beginning of my innocence, I immediately felt that something was off. But five years ago, it seemed to me that you simply didn't want to accept the obvious. And now, since fate has brought us together again, I decided to delve deeper into this case and enlisted the help of a trusted detective. A good detective I've worked with him before. Just an hour ago, he finished his work and provided me with all the data. Richard nodded towards the back seat. There lay a black folder stuffed with files. And what's in there? The woman scoffed contemptuously. Decided to buy some more evidence from who knows where. 
No, it's quite specific data photos, videos, screenshots of correspondence. The examination established that Frankie was drunk on the day of the accident, right? Open the first page, please. Stella reluctantly reached for the folder. The whole idea seemed foolish to her, but Richard did not dismiss her suspicions right away, and that was appealing. She opened the folder. As a doctor, it should be easy for you to understand that the substance found in Frankie's blood can only indirectly be related to alcohol. Stella Reed, frowning more and more. Indeed, it wasn't alcohol in his blood. But this is... Correct, Richard nodded. A drug that reduces alertness and control over the body. It was injected into him right before he got behind the wheel. But how is that possible? What? Stella's tormented gaze shifted from the folder to Richard. This sounded much more convincing than the drunkenness theory and thus inspired trust. Well, that's all the good news, unfortunately, the man grimaced. The detective found out who did it and why, but I'm afraid you won't like it. Stella tried to quickly leaf through the folder, but it didn't work. There was too much information, and her brain couldn't even pick out separate words. She had to turn to the man, waiting for further explanations. Well, go on, she decided. If there's a working theory, I want to know it. All right, I'll try. Tell me after Frankie's death, did you sell his business to interested parties? Stella flinched slightly. Yes, I didn't understand anything about it myself and wouldn't have been able to continue it. Besides, it was very hard for me because I had a young son to take care of, and I sold his business. Richard turned to look her in the eyes. There was clearly intense mental activity going on, and the conclusions she was drawing were not pleasing her. Yes, Richard confirmed sorrowfully. You guessed correctly. Those very people offered Frankie to sell his business at a very low price, and he refused. And as a result, there was an unfortunate incident after which they bought the business for even less than they had originally planned. The amount they paid you is almost half of what your husband found unacceptable. Stella sat, clutching the folder so tightly that the crunch could be heard throughout the cabin. Uncontrollable tears streamed down her cheeks. So, it's all because of him. Because of the business, she quietly asked. I'm afraid so, Richard nodded sympathetically. They had already been parked in front of Stella's house for a couple of minutes, but she hadn't noticed, still staring into space. But actually, that's not even the worst news. Stella turned her head towards him. She seriously doubted that there could be worse news than what she had just heard. I would have stayed silent and let you discover this on your own, but I'm afraid you need at least some mental preparation. First, this business was not all smooth sailing from the beginning. There were some pretty murky and contentious moments, and not just once. It's possible that your husband himself wasn't above using methods that eventually backfired on him. I think the partners simply clashed over spheres of influence. And one more thing. I didn't just say that Frankie was injected with that drug. There's a video recording confirming this, but you won't like its background. You see, at that moment Frankie was leaving the house of his regular mistress. How dare you, Stella threw the folder. Angry tears welled up in her eyes. She wasn't going to believe such nonsense. Even if this guy was trying to clear his name by proving he wasn't involved in the accident, she wouldn't let him tarnish Frankie's memory. Goodbye, she barked, flying out of the car. Richard cursed and jumped out of the car after her. He called out to Stella and asked her to take the folder with the evidence. I understand you don't believe me, he said softly, looking into her eyes. I'm not asking you to believe me. But I ask you to believe the facts. Try to figure it out yourself. I just tried to prepare you for what you might find in there. He squeezed Stella's fingers, not letting her drop the documents in the wet snow, 
and turned back to the car, which he had left unlocked. Stella watched Richard drive away and snorted, wanting to immediately throw the damn folder into the trash, but that despicable guy had managed to plant a seed of doubt in her soul, and she just couldn't bring herself to discard something that might contain the answers to all her questions. In the apartment, as usual, Tony immediately ran to greet her, and Stella tried to smile strangely. Apparently, she did a very poor job. Her son didn't notice anything, but the neighbor who had come up to greet her immediately offered to sit with the boy a little longer. Stella could only find the strength to nod gratefully. Tony was led away to play, though he was unhappy about it, and Stella locked herself in her room. She hesitated for a long time to open the folder, as if it were some poisonous filth, but she had to pull herself together because time was of the essence. She had already seen the first document the very expert conclusion that had been filed in the main case in a slightly altered form. Was it by accident, or did someone help? Then the papers began to flash before her eyes. There really was detailed correspondence between Frankie and some woman, quite explicit in nature, and copies of bank checks that showed the real state of affairs. It turned out that Frankie brought home at most half of the money he actually had, and some of the amounts Stella had no idea about went to pamper his mistress. Checks for expensive hotels, restaurants, jewellery. The numbers were staggering. Much less was spent on her and Tony. Among all the papers in the folder, a photograph of a girl, around four years old, was found. There were no explanatory notes attached, so Stella frowned and set it aside. She also found Richard's phone number. He had written it right on the folder, inviting her to call if she ever needed to talk. Stella grimaced and ignored the offer. They had nothing to discuss. Fortunately, she had a day off the next day. She took her son to kindergarten and decided to visit Frankie's grave. It had been a while since she last went there. After her husband's funeral, this place had become her constant refuge. Stella tried to come here whenever she had a free moment, as if it could somehow help her. Today was no different. She habitually swept the fresh snow off the top of the monument. Under the snow, petals of artificial red flowers peeked out strange. Last time, she had left live flowers. Had a friend come by. Stella placed a small bouquet of chrysanthemums beside them and thoughtfully examined the engraved portrait on the monument. For the posthumous image, she had chosen one of her favorite photographs of her husband. In it, he was smiling brightly and openly, looking as if right into one's soul. Stella shook her head in disappointment. She had once believed those eyes could not lie. She would have continued standing there, but she heard the crunch of snow underfoot behind her. Since visitors were rare at the cemetery early in the morning, Stella turned around. A woman was approaching, leading a girl of about seven. The girl looked vaguely familiar. Hello, the stranger greeted politely. May I? Without waiting for Stella's reply, she walked past her to Frankie's grave and placed a bouquet of artificial red flowers, identical to the ones covered by fresh snow, beside the chrysanthemums. The weather's gotten worse, she complained. I just brought flowers yesterday, and now I have to bring more. Were you acquainted with him? Stella asked with a stony face. She liked this woman less and less with every second. Of course we were, the woman nodded calmly. He probably never told you about us, did he? Of course he didn't. But I know who you are. I've seen you here many times, but I never dared to approach. And what was he supposed to tell me, Stella asked, tilting her head to one side, feigning softness. About us, the woman said, staring directly into her eyes. My name is Sally and our daughter is Rita. Frankie and I loved each other. Stella felt the ground slip from under her feet. Her mind raced with a thousand retorts. She wanted to scream that she didn't believe it, that it couldn't be true. 
but only yesterday she had confirmed that it indeed could be, with all the evidence. And now the living proof had decided to present itself. And you knew, Stella hissed angrily. You knew he was married but still got involved. Sally squinted at her disdainfully. Of course I knew, she nodded. We met almost immediately after your wedding, and he assured me he married you out of necessity. For almost four years he promised he would leave you and come to us. I gave birth to his daughter before you did. He loved us, whether you want to believe it or not. Shut up, Stella shouted, covering her ears with her hands. Frankie wasn't like that. He lived with us, celebrated my career successes, was my support and rock. He didn't have any particular need to marry me, but he did it without the slightest pressure from me. He chose me because he loved me. Ona turned away, intending to run as far from the grave as possible, but Sally called out to her. Wait, Stella would have kept going, but Sally started coughing violently. Her daughter. The same girl whose photo was in the spiteful folder, just a little older, reached into her small backpack with a familiar gesture and pulled out a water bottle, handing it to her mother. She drank. The fit subsided, and only then could she address Stella, who watched the scene with poorly disguised scepticism. You see, it's really bad. Metastasis. I'm going through one chemotherapy after another, but they're not helping much. I don't have much time left. Congratulations, Stella muttered. As a doctor, she couldn't be angry with a sick person, but a petty thought crossed her mind. It seemed like karma getting its due. Thank you, Sally said with a sour smile. Of course, she didn't expect pity, but such blatant contempt couldn't leave her indifferent. I didn't just open up to you after all these years for nothing. The thing is, I have no relatives, none at all. And after I die, Rita will be sent to an orphanage. I know it's quite bold of me, but I wanted to ask you to take care of her in memory of Frankie. Or maybe transfer the property directly to both of you, Stella squinted. Do I look like a charity? I still have to raise my son. And sorry, I really don't care about the two of you. With those words, she turned away for good, heading towards the bus stop, leaving Sally and her daughter standing by Frankie's grave, watching her go. Mom, I hope she's not the aunt you wanted to hand me over to, the girl asked anxiously. She's so mean. I don't want an evil stepmother like in fairy tales. Can you stay? I would love to. Sweetheart, Sally said, sadly adjusting her daughter's hat. I would love to stay with you until the end of your days, but unfortunately, all parents sooner or later need to leave, and I need to make sure you'll be in good hands. Stella almost ran towards home, not caring about the way. Usually she always went to the cemetery by bus, but now she was so upset that she decided to walk for forty minutes. Everything she read yesterday turned out to be true. Everything Richard told her, every single word turned out to be true. Everything she couldn't believe yesterday was true, the absolute truth. Stella felt like she was going to be sick from such truth. Her soul seemed to split in two. One of these halves deeply regretted ever agreeing to listen to the man and accept documents from him. Not knowing the whole truth about a husband who had been buried for five years would have been much easier. And the other half cried because she and Tony turned out to be deceived. All those kisses, talks about the future, assurances of love lies, every last word lies. When she got home, Stella herself didn't understand how her hands opened that unfortunate black folder and dialed Richard's number. For some reason, she didn't want to see anyone but him now. Funny, but it turns out, only he was absolutely honest with her from the very beginning. The man picked up the phone almost instantly, listening. It's Stella. Can we talk? Got it. Are you home? I'll send you a driver. He'll be there in ten minutes. Don't go anywhere, okay? 
Okay, slightly bewildered by such urgency, the girl hung up the phone. It often happens that subjectively, time flows a little differently. Usually when you're waiting for something, minutes can seem very long, like hours. But to Stella, it seemed like she had only had a sip of water when the phone rang again. Yes. Hello, is this Stella? A deep, unfamiliar voice came through the phone. It's Richard's associate. I've arrived. I'm standing outside your house. You can come out. Okay. The bewildered woman, not fully comprehending what was happening, stepped outside. There was only one unfamiliar car in the yard, and Stella headed straight for it. As she approached, the driver helped open the door and reintroduced himself to avoid any misunderstandings. Stella confirmed her identity, allowing herself to be led in an unknown direction. The journey was short, just ten minutes. The driver parked the car in front of a beautiful apartment building, helped Stella out of the car, and escorted her past the security inside. Stella walked still not understanding why she had been brought to this place, until a familiar voice called out to her from the staircase. Richard hadn't changed much since yesterday, but Stella still looked at him as if she were seeing him for the first time. Only now did she allow herself to notice that the man looked like a real heartthrob at forty. Richard, who had been expecting Stella to arrive in a distressed state, immediately led her to his office. There he seated her on a soft couch, poured wine, and ordered food. Stella felt like a princess. Then, unable to hold back, she burst into tears and began to pour out her heart. It came out very chaotic, but Richard already knew the main points himself, so he just sympathized with her. After crying it out, Stella had a little to drink and attempted to apologize for her behavior, but Richard waved it off. Don't worry, it's my fault for involving you in this. You would have been better off not knowing any of this, or you would have thought me unjustly guilty. It wouldn't matter much, I would have survived. Forgive me for that, really, forgive me. I'm just foolish, refusing to face the facts. They didn't notice when they had switched to using tie with each other. It just happened, as if it were understood as if it should have always been that way. By the way, is it okay for me to be here? Stella suddenly realized. I remember you're married. Was married, Richard nodded, but my ex-wife, whom you might have seen in court, left me four years ago, and the other one, whom I managed to marry, stormed into my room right in front of you. That blonde who threw a vase at me caught her cheating, Damn, I even got injured because of her, you could say. Wow, Stella whistled. You've had quite the eventful life for sure. Care to share? Richard, shrugging, began to recount his adventures. They realized it was almost five o'clock. Oh, Tony is still at daycare, Stella exclaimed, grabbing her head. I forgot to ask the neighbor to watch him today. Are you going? Richard tilted his head. Stella looked at him, at the table set for them, at the blanket under which she sat, and she suddenly felt a strong desire to run away, impossible to describe in words. No, maybe she could still warn her. With one call, she asked the neighbor for help, explaining that unforeseen circumstances had arisen, and the neighbor happily agreed. She really had nothing to do in her apartment in her old age, and looking after someone else's child was her only relief. And Stella and Richard stayed under the warm blanket until dawn. Just six months later, Stella was packing her things to move. Who would have thought that a woman who had discovered the truth about her deceased husband and a man who had been through three unhappy marriages would come together so quickly and easily in their outlooks on life? Their romance spun so quickly that she herself didn't realize how it happened. Talking to Richard had become a necessity for her at some point. 
he turned out to be an understanding, attentive conversationalist who had previously only dealt with superficial girls. It was new for him to discover that girls could be so human and knowledgeable about something other than types of cosmetics. And for her, it was a surprise that the guy she had accused of all sins turned out to be a well-educated owner of a huge company that had been thriving for more than seven years. Dates and cafe meetings turned into something more. Tony, having met the man entirely by chance, although Stella suspected that the cunning admirer had simply timed when she would be returning from daycare with her son, greeted him with great enthusiasm. The boy was absolutely thrilled to be in the presence of such an authoritative figure. Through every action, Tony sparked joy, and thus the boy quickly accepted him as a father figure. Stella was overjoyed. The boy, growing up without a father, could now start to find his way with such a worthy example to emulate. Especially since now the girl wasn't sure anymore whether it would have been better if his real father had stayed alive. The decision was made to sell the apartment where she and her son had lived before. Stella couldn't bear to stay here any longer after everything she had learned, so as soon as she finished processing all the paperwork, she began to slowly pack up. Tony, from this day forward, was already settling into the new apartment under Richard's supervision, while Stella gathered the remaining items, some too sentimental to discard, and others seemingly not worth keeping. Her gathering was suddenly interrupted by a phone call. The number was unfamiliar. Stella answered surprised. Hello. Good afternoon. Is this Stella? An elderly voice asked. Yes. My name is Miranda Flores. I'm Sally's neighbor. Which Sally, Stella asked, her voice slightly trembling. She knew several girls named Sally, but of course of all the possible options, this turned out to be the worst. She said you know her. She left your phone number for contact. The thing is, she passed away yesterday. Her funeral is today and tomorrow her daughter is being taken to a shelter. Sally asked before she died that you take care of the child. Rita will be waiting for you. I understand. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Of course it wasn't a blatant surprise, as Stella remembered Sally's illness. But the sudden echo from the past, the old wounds, still stung. That same evening, Stella consulted Richard on the matter, as the only person whose opinion mattered to her, and collectively they agreed that the girl was to be pitied. She wasn't at fault for being born to such a negligent father who decided to start two families simultaneously. So the next day, they both went to the shelter to inquire about the fate of the little girl. The girl had already been brought here, but she hadn't had time to settle in yet so it seemed that only they were awaiting her. As soon as Stella inquired about the child's fate, she was promptly brought over, and Rita ran to hug her. Hi. Are you my new mum? She asked naively, hugging the woman around the waist. I knew you would come. Mum warned that new parents would come for me right away, she said in a childishly innocent tone. Stella hugged the little girl in response and glanced at Richard with a troubled look, and he immediately understood his beloved would never part with this girl. The documents were processed as quickly as possible. Tony, overall satisfied with the move and his new stepfather, reacted quite calmly to the appearance of a new little sister. It's even more fun than just with these adults alone, he remarked. The children quickly found common ground. Richard and Stella had a lavish outdoor wedding. There weren't many relatives present, as Stella had none, and Richard only had his mother and brother with their families. But they invited so many friends that instead of a restaurant, they had to order an outdoor buffet, yet the newlyweds were happy regardless. And a year later, Stella, feeling embarrassed, confessed to her beloved that she was pregnant, and Richard, a rugged 40-year-old man almost cried at the news.
he spun his wife around the house in his arms. He had long dreamed of having a child of his own. If you liked the story, please support me with the thumbs up button. It's just one click for you, but it's very important for me. Thank you.